as long as you, you're true to yourself. If you're trying to start a, a media company, is th thinking, okay, what's going to work? What's the market and everything? You're dead. Like if you have a strong idea and you think, you know what, that's what I want to see, do it. Yeah, sure. It's the best way to make it. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? I'm good, thanks. Good. Sorry for the French accent. Well, I'm, I have the same, so that's... that's uh, like mine that. is worse, believe <laughs> me. Okay, so my first question is about the... Um, I want you to tell us about the inception of the project. Um, if I'm not wrong, it was late 2016 that yes. you and your co-founders created Brut. Um, and also I want to know back in time, because now you know that it, it's a success so far, but was that um, just a shot in the dark? By the time it was a bet. How Kinda, did that yeah. Um, my my partners and myself, we all coming from the TV world, and and actually, Brut was made out of uh, frustration. We were it was just before the presidential campaign in France. We were trying to to sell a TV show to uh, the network. And the TV show was mainly what Brood is now. I mean, the, the main idea was already there. And um, we just couldn't do it. And uh, we were seeing the campaign coming. We were seeing the far left and far right very active on social network. We were seeing the uh, legacy media nowhere on social network, or at least not very uh, relevant. So at some point after like the 20th, no from a, net, from a network. We say, you know what, we, I was, was in April, I think, 2016. I was very mad and I just sent a long text to my partner saying, you know what, why should we wait? Why do we want to go on a network? There's 30 million people every day on Facebook. Uh, let's go there. Let's do, you know. <laughs> and so we did, we did basically that. Um, the thing is, as we all come from the TV world, we, all are, we, we were producer, director, journalist. Uh, we knew something which was, uh, when it comes to media, uh, you need to really invest in your team. I guess it's, <laughs> it's the same everywhere. But when you want to launch, like three years ago, when we launched, when we went to, I mean, we tried to find financial partner, obviously. People were laughing at us, basically. And, um, and th th they were always saying the same thing, which was, uh, you want to start a media on social? So already it was like weird. Um, and then, so it means you want to talk to young people, uh, which was not the case. We just wanted to, you know, like address uh, topics. Um, so why don't you take young people to do it? Why do you want to hire a very experienced TV producer to lead your team? It's, it costs a lot of money. Just take, a, you know, a young kid out of school and, and do it. So it was the first misunderstanding with the uh, financial community, the first of many. Uh, believe me. Um, and then so we, we basically launched at that. And the great thing with social network is uh, it's not TV. When you do TV, uh, you have a press announcement. You say, you know what, I need, to, I need to be ready and everything. The great thing with social network is if what you do is bad, nobody's going to see it. No. So there's no risk, basically. The only risk is you're going to spend money producing stuff that nobody is going to see. But it was a good way to just launch. So one day, November 16th, we are like, mm, yeah, we think we're ready. Let's shoot. And, it, and we went like that. And what type of investors were you looking at back in time? Because the financial, I mean, it's a very wide community. So at the time, I had, I had absolutely no experience. I, I mean, yeah. I had a TV company before. I set up my own production uh, company. But uh, TV is a very simple business. If you, I mean, if you are able to sell to a client, to a network, they give you money, you make money out of it, that's it. So you don't need ready to raise money. So I had no idea how to raise. Um, so the only people I knew were uh, legacy media. So I went to the legacy media world with my partners and we say, oh, look, we have this great project. Everybody was like, uh, no. Um, and, uh, and that was it. And I, I, <laughs> I mean, maybe it's a bit too much, but it's like almost like I didn't know the VC world. Yeah. Like, you know, I had no idea what venture capital was. Uh, was yeah. maybe Wall Street for me, like the movie. Uh, th that's it. So um, we just went with our own money and we got very lucky with uh, Xavier Niel, who was yeah. our first investor. Very uh, lucky. And how did you convince him then? So it's, in, it's an incredible story. So 
we launched in November 16. Uh, when we launched, we wanted to do 20 million video views a month after a year. Uh, we did that in six weeks. So we were like, ooh, that's cool, let's do that. And we picked up very incredibly during the campaign. We were leading the social conversation in, during the campaign. And um, in March, we were already doing like 50, 60 million video views a month in Facebook, which was already a lot. And um, we used the money from our TV production company to finance Brut. So we used, uh, which is a very bad idea, we used the cash flow of our TV production company to finance Brut. And our, um, our general manager came to us in March saying, guys, we have an issue which is in a month from now. We're running out of money, so we're going to go into bankruptcy. So we're like, okay, so we're going to bankrupt Brut. He said, no, we're going to bankrupt the, everything, like the whole company, which was kind of funny and tricky because we, I mean, it, it, it would have meant that we couldn't have done the TV contract we had. Um, so <laughs> we started to sweat a lot, were kind of panicking, and um, we had a miracle, which was, I, I really do remember, I was with my partner on um, Le Pont Neuf in Paris, in a car, and um, my partner knew Xavier Niel, and Xavier was uh, following what we were doing on Brut. Xavier is calling my partner, saying, oh, I have a story for you, I'm in vacation with Evan Spiegel, the founder of Snapchat, um, and my kids, so at the time I think the Xavier's kids were maybe 16, 17, something like that. And this morning I'm going to breakfast with Ivan, my two kids are here with their phone like that, you know, looking at the phone. Ivan asked them, what are you looking at? And they both say, we're looking at Brut. So Xavier's kids pitched Brut to Ivan and Xavier, which is a good pitch to have, you know. <laughs> and, um, and Xavier called us and said, so what's up guys? And we said, you know what's up, in a month from now we're dead. So he said, okay, pitch, pitch me brute. So we stopped on the Pont Neuf, we put the hazard lights, <laughs> and we pitched Xavier on the phone for 45 minutes. And after 45 minutes, he's like, okay, I, I'm in. How much do you need? So we, <laughs> we told him, uh, which was like a lot for us at the time. And uh, he said, okay, you have the money tomorrow. We didn't sign anything at the time, yeah. and we got the money tomorrow. So it's really a, like it's a miracle. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, mean, kudos to Xavier and the kids. Yeah. <laughs> I should have, you know, given them a cut, yeah. maybe. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's, it was really a, like a miracle. So, um, uh, and after we we became more professional at raising money. Yeah. So I like also this anecdote because um, it's we don't talk much about that, but how luck, the concept of luck, is very important when you launch a company. And at the family, we see that a lot, actually. Sometimes we can't explain really what happened uh, with the company, the success or um, the, the failure, um, but it all comes down to luck a lot of time. So I thought uh, it was a great illustration. It's, it's um, I don't know, it's, I, I guess it's a question of, um, I mean, if you want to do something, um, it's probably because you feel like there's a need or at least you have the need to do it and you hope that uh, other people have the same need, and you, and you should. So um, a lot of time we say luck, so in the case of Xavier, it, we can say it's luck, but at the same time, my partner, Renaud, was producing the biggest TV shows, yeah. like for the French people, he was doing Le Grand Journal, for instance, on Canal+. Plus. Um, so he was very well known, Xavier knew him, he built, he built a relationship with him, then we launched Brut, Launch Brut was already a huge success and everything, so yes, you, you need to have that, that, that spark, mm -hmm. you know, but at the same time, it's like the, the planets which are aligning. I think it's, a, it's more a question of timing that, than luck, but like you never know if the yeah. timing is right until you do it. Yeah. And, um, okay, so before we get back to the, um, the whole fundraising thing and everything, um, obviously I want to address the elephant in the room, which is the, um, the state of the media industry. Nowadays. That's great. <laughs> uh, which is a wide topic, I guess. But um, I wanted to know your stance on, you know, the, uh, w the split between the so-called old and new media. What's what's up with this? See, it's it's um, it's a very complex issue because for the first time, really, there's a huge generation gap, a huge one, um, f because of technology. So basically, you have people. You have a gray area which is like 30 to 50, 45. Um, and you have 50 plus and like let's say under 25. Um, 
if you are 50 plus, you've born and raised in a world where you had access to like free main TV, free main uh, you know press outlet, free main radio, and they all had the news, the same news cycle. So that's the way you do you, you do it. You watch TV, you read text, and everything. Thanks to social platform and mobile phone, um, you have a generation of people who first of all don't watch TV and um, don't have the same sense of news cycle and everything. So the, the issue, um, when I left TV for digital and social, <coughs> I really thought that it was like TV versus uh, social versus print and everything. I don't think it's the issue. The issue is old brand versus new brand. Um, and when you talk to like, so we reach 300 million, uh, no, actually we don't reach, we have 300 million uh, monthly viewer, unique. Um, 70% 70, 70 of them are under 35. When you reach those kind of people, um, I mean, you see incredible thing. The, and and the, 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 the biggest revolution, because it's really a, re a revolution, is the following. Uh, and I think the legacy media didn't really get it. When you are on social platform, what you are doing actually is conversation. That's it. Uh, you go on Snapchat to have a conversation with your friends. You go on Snapchat, you go on Facebook to have a conversation with your friends or a community, etc., etc. So when you are on social, what you, what you need to do is to spark conversation. That's it. Video is a tool to do that. It's a great tool to do it. But if you don't get that, if you think that social platform is just a way where you can push your content, it just doesn't work. So that's, there's a huge generation gap. Um, I don't think there's a crisis of, uh, you know, I'm always saying there's a crisis of uh, attention. That's bullshit. So if, there's a, if there is a crisis of attention, explain to me why people, like all of us, we are binge watching Netflix. You know, if there's a crisis of attention, why are we able to spend like 12 hours in a row watching whatever series? You know, why uh, are we able, like Brute for instance, no, we, are, we can retain people on, on Snapchat, we retain people more than a minute through our story, which is like by Snap standard huge. So I don't think there's a crisis of the attention, but because there are so many choices out there, the question is when you put your attention on something and when you, you, you too many times you are disappointed by what you see. So if you put your attention on something and that's great, you stay. You know, so the, the, the point is like, how do you make it great? And for new generation, <clears throat> there's an issue. So conversation, the first issue. And the second issue is, uh, I'm old, I'm 45. Um, when I was 20, if I wanted to produce something, I needed like a very fancy camera, I needed the sound editor, I needed the editing room and everything. Um, today, we all have learned to produce content through social platforms, stories, whatever. Um, so it means that in order for us to feel engaged with the content, it needs to feel authentic. I mean, it needs to, to feel the way we would have done it ourselves. Um, so when you come from the TV world and you don't understand that, that stuff, I'm going to give you a very simple example. Brut has been made in terms of format, um, mirroring um, FaceTime, basically. So we shoot people like a FaceTime conversation. So people look straight because basically when you, you know, when you're talking to your friends, you look straight. Um, you don't look off, uh, off field because there's no journalist there. So actually it's quite funny because at the beginning, I don't know, I don't have my phone, but can I borrow your phone? Sure. Okay. So at the very beginning, I'm going to show you. At the very beginning, we shoot with an iPhone. We don't have any like, cameras. So at the beginning, when we were doing our first interview, we were like that. Um, Slightly close. Yeah, and so the great thing is people are totally forgetting. They are in a very good conversation, but the first time we did like huge political figure in France, they were like, there's no team, there's no crew. It's like, well, yeah, yeah, we, we're there, we, you know. <laughs> and that's, that's the huge revolution to you. Once again, you need to, have, to be able to create that type of content that resonates through the audience because it really feels the same. Yeah, sure. So now in 2020, is it something still hard to launch a media company in terms of 
you know, the how easy it will be to make that profitable and stuff like that, because the reputation is still, I mean, not great in terms of profitability of you know, this kind um, of business. So 2020, BuzzFeed in the US is going to turn profitable. Yeah. Vice in the US is going to turn profitable. Um, Barstool, which is a media platform, was sold yeah. yesterday 450 million to a, to a casino, <laughs> actually, for the betting rights. Um, so it's a pretty good um, period of time. Axios is going to be profitable in the, in the US. Uh, there's a lot of new subscription model. Uh, there's room for um, meet, like free media ad-based, like we are. Um, we are already profitable in France, so yes. Yeah, that, that, that was also one of my following questions. Yeah. That's great, and because, sorry, I didn't ask, is there someone in the crowd or a few people who are willing to launch a media company or a media startup or? There's yes. one. Yes, or oh, two. Two, cool. Oh, four, five, okay. Amazing, okay, cool. Yeah. Mm. No, no, I think there's plenty of room, as long as you, uh, I, you know, <laughs> le, I, I didn't do any um, business school or whatever, so we don't do uh, market studies and everything. Um, and, and, and What's your background, actually? Um, snowboarding, mainly. Okay, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I went to, I did Sciences Po uh, in Grenoble because I wanted to snowboard. Sure. Uh, so okay. I did Obviously. Sciences Po snowboard, I would say. Um, <laughs> and then I, then I was not a very good snowboarder, so I'm, I started to write for a mm -hmm. snowboarding magazine. And, ah. and then for Lakeep and everything, and then TV came to me and okay, was like, oh, it's interesting, it and I became like that. So my point is, uh, to the people in the room who wants to start a media company, I think it's a great time to do it. But at the same time, uh, it, as long as you, you're true to yourself, if you're trying to start a, a media company, is th thinking, okay, what's going to work, what's the market, and everything, you're dead. Like, if you have a strong idea and you think, you know what, that's what I want to see, do it. Sure. It's the best way to make it. I think I said uh, it's eight. You're on present on eight different social platforms. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Is it eight? So I don't know. Maybe it's seven or nine. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. <clears throat> so let's say you want to um, try TikTok, for example. Yeah. Your rationale is just let's try that. It seems cool. Yeah. Like you okay? Yeah. yeah. That's no, <laughs> the, the, our point is uh, um, so in France, we reach 100% of millennials every month. Um, our strategy is to make sure that we are at every point of contact with the generation. So all social platform, uh, Spotify, Netflix, Amazon. Um, you know, like so we just launched on Spotify like two weeks ago, <coughs> with a lot of success. So we we have like a, a daily podcast, uh, six six podcasts today. We're very happy about that. We're going, you know, we we so TikTok is a good example. We uh, launch on TikTok. Uh, it's going great. It's fascinating to speak to a younger audience, even younger than Snapchat. Um, it's uh, very interesting to see what you do as a media company in a very entertainment world. Um, it's, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. cool. And then, uh, in terms of your editorial positioning, um, because Brut is well known for being quite positive in terms of how you deal with the news coverage and the, yeah, the news role. Um, since when is that something you chose from th from day one? Yes. Okay, and mm -hmm. something I guess you're very strict in terms of like you don't wanna. So the yeah. the thing is when we launched Brut, we had several intuition. Now we are sure of it. The first the first mm -hmm. thing is like people are fed up with uh, journalists telling them what to think. Um, so you need to provide them with tools to understand the world and then to go into an educated conversation. First thing. The second thing. You need to produce the content as they would do it, as I said. Um, and the other thing is, if you, like the news cycle <laughs> in everywhere in the world is dominated by, we all gonna die, okay? So right now we all gonna die from the Chinese virus, or if we don't die from the Chinese virus, we're going to die from climate change, um, whatever. Um, so we thought at the very beginning that uh, we wanted to put light on change maker, but like, normal people, uh, people doing stuff every day to try to change things, whatever it is. And then very quickly we understood that we saw, actually when we launched Brut in France, we've seen very quickly that our video were um, consumed all across the world and in, in part of the world where they absolutely don't speak French. So uh, what we understood very quickly was there's a set of value for millennials and Gen Z 
that works across the globe. Uh, power accountability, and it goes for political figure, institution, brands, women's rights, fighting any kind of discrimination, social impact, social good, and especially for generations who think their parents failed miserably handing them a healthy planet, and the environment, plus entertainment, music, sport, uh, but entertainment is very local. Um, so the great thing for us is we were able to create a global media because right now we've, we're posting 50 videos a day. 25 of them are working all, like everywhere in the world uh, because they share you know, that set of value. And, it's, um, and, and when, you know, when you say that, you say, okay, that's you're very left, you know, it's very progressist. So it's probably progressist, yes. But it's a huge misconception of first generation. Um, which is they don't care if it's left or right. Either you contribute positively to that set of value, you're a good guy, you don't, you're a bad guy. That's it. And then we can talk about left and right. Um, so when you do understand all this, you can you know, like really thrive. Okay, so you um, distribute the content across the globe. Uh, you have multiple audiences, different markets, countries, um, and you do. Um, you did uh, launch an uh, open an office in the US, in New York. Um, why? Why? <laughs> what were the rationale? It, it, it's cool. Because it's cool. Yeah, yeah. No, it's cool. It's I, like I, mean, I love New York. I thought it was a great idea to go there. No, um, I'm interested in like. Why, why the U.S. market yes. and how, how you make that happen? So, um, the, the, when we started, which we started in France, we, we grew very quickly in France. Then we saw that our um, video were seen all across the globe. We said, you know what, let's try it. And, and Facebook, Facebook called us saying, There's some, something is happening with your video, you should try the U.S. Uh, so we tried the U.S. with three journalists in Paris. Uh, in June 2017, we did 50 million views uh, in a month from Paris. We were like, woo, cool. Um, then we, at the time, we, were, uh, we had some money. So we went to Xavier and we said, okay, we're going to the US. He said, great. And we said, we want to open a third uh, country to just to, to have a strong business case. And uh, we told him, because <laughs> for the same reason as New York, was, we thought it was cool. We say we want to go to uh, Brazil. Mm -hmm. yeah, I love surfing, so. <laughs> and uh, it makes sense. And uh, Xavier laughed and said, no, you're not going to Brazil, you're going to India. I was like, <laughs> why? He said, because the middle class is the size of the US, because there's a telco war around 4G, so Indians are coming into the 4G now. They're going to be able to watch a lot of videos uh, because it's the biggest Facebook market. So you should really go there. Thanks to him, now we are the biggest English-speaking media on social in India. Um, That's impressive. So in, India is the first market for Facebook? Yes. Okay. In the, and the second one is uh, the North America. Okay. <coughs> and the thing is, North America is already saturated. Yeah. India is going to double. Yeah. So India is around like 300 million units uh, a day. It's going to be 500 million in three years for Facebook. So th th that's, that's, that's how we decided to, to go. And I forgot your question. <coughs> no, in terms of opening an office. Oh, yeah, um, sorry. Thank you. Um, so at some point, we thought that for the US, which is like the biggest market in the world, we needed to be there um, in order to, yeah, to have a better sense of, uh, you know, um, of the market. Plus, it's great to establish relationship. I don't like Slack, for instance. You know, it makes me crazy. Ooh. Yeah, I know. It makes me crazy for one thing. So we did something very, very funny or terrifying. It depends the way you see it. In, in the US uh, office, we have forbidden Slack for a week. We say, OK, no Slack. And actually, what happened is like people actually talk to each other. Because you know? they were slacking each other, sitting across, okay? and they were like slacking. So why do I say that? Because in, especially as a young entrepreneur or as a young startup, I think, um, I mean, you're going to do your, your work, you're going to put it out there and everything, but um, it's great to establish relationship with your partners. So we wanted to see the people at Facebook, we wanted to see the people at Snap, we wanted to see the people at Instagram, Twitter, whatever. We wanted to meet the influencer and everything. So we thought we needed to be in the US. 
And 18 months after that, I moved in the US uh, to, to push it even more. And, and New York is much, so New York is the center of news in the US. Yeah. Plus, as a French company, it's a nightmare to work with LA because there's nine hour time difference. It's too, it's like it's too, too much. Yeah. Okay. It's only six hours for New York, so it's cool. And in terms of, did you find any cultural bias that yes. you had to fight? Yeah. There are a lot of companies that want, uh, European companies that want to launch in the US. Um, they just start the whole process with a lot of fantasies. Um, and they usually, um, yeah, they're not quite sure about how to do it, how to do the first steps as well. Um, what was your own experience? So we, we got lucky with the US because when we launched editorially, uh, it, it was insane from day one. Uh, right now we are in the top five of the biggest publisher in the US. We are in front of a, a head of CNN, for instance, on social, those kind of things. So we huge. So we felt confident that you know, it's, it's, it's better. Then when we wanted to monetize, then, <laughs> then the, the um, complicated thing started. So we did a lot of mistakes. The first one was, um, I, I mean, I loved the US. So I was like, wow, I'm going to the US. That's so cool. You know? And don't do that. Like the US, it's exactly like France, but it's much bigger. There's more competition, more money, whatever, but it's, it's the same. So not glorify no. the Amer American. No, and in many ways, uh, the stuff we're doing, you know, in, in a better way. The second thing, uh, which, so, it, and it's linked. The first thing was, wow, I mean, the US is incredible. The second thing was like, um, but we're pretty good, because in France, or me, I can do myself what five Americans are going to do, okay? And uh, that's great. It's a huge mistake to think that way, because for the US, it's a question of scale. So when you say that, and it took me like a year to understand. When you say that to, to the US, you say, yeah, I'm very, mu I'm very, I'm very much more productive than you because I do like so many things at the same time. And they laugh at you. They're like, yeah, because you have a small market and you don't have the means to have five people doing actually five things. You need to do it yourself. So if, you know what, if you do everything yourself, it's scary for us. You should have five people doing that. You'd be much more efficient. And actually, I think it's one, it's one of the reasons why um, uh, the U.S. company, especially the U.S. startup, are so agile to scale because at the heart of the way they are processed, they're, already, they're ready to scale because it's always the same thing. They have a very clear process. They have a goal and they have like a performance review very quickly. In France, we, like, at, <laughs> at least in the media world and mine world, we never done that. So we had no process except producing content, no performance review, so it's super hard to scale. So actually, it's, what it's, it's why we raised the money we raised um, with the Series B. We raised $40 million. <clears throat> One of the reasons why it's like we needed a little bit of time and money to clean our room, mm -hmm. process the company, and be ready to scale and to raise much more in like 18 months. Yeah, cool. Interesting. And then, so in the US, you only, I guess, uh, hire American, uh, you only work with American partners. So you, yeah. are, you need to go full US. Full US. Yep. And the other thing is, which is tough with the US, is uh, uh, when you launch in the US, you need to launch the US way. Yeah. So um, you, want a, you want a CTO, you want a CFO, you want a CEO, you want <laughs> whatever O you want. Um, you, if you do it the French way, you're going to try to connect with people you know through LinkedIn, yeah. something like that, and say, <laughs> hey, come work for me, that's cool. And yeah. people are going to be like, what's happening? Mm -hmm. So you need to go to the big, um, uh, to the big company who are going to, you know, like head, uh, headhunters. They're going to take upfront one third of their, um, the salary of the guy for one year. So it's a lot of money. Okay, that's a lot. New York price, you pay people like 30% more than in France. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's tough. And the other thing is, uh, <laughs> we, we realized when we, uh, when we went to market in the US to monetize, um, that we were lazy in France because the the repu like the the media brand in France is it's so big now that clients were coming to us very easily. So we were in the U.S. We we're like, okay, you don't know us well, but you know what? We have this cool company. We are huge in France. We are huge in India. So <laughs> American absolutely don't care about that. They're like, okay, but what about the U.S.? 
So you're like, oh, we're reaching 25% uh, of millennials already in the US. I say, okay, why not? Um, but we were not prepared enough. So it's, 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 it was very, it's a very interesting um, journey because when the first six months in the US, the first six months of go-to-market, we hit a wall yeah. day after day uh, because it took us a while to understand uh, the way we should have done it. So now we know. The codes. Yeah, yeah, and we've been bullshitted so much by American <laughs> people. It's unbelievable. We had two head of sales that we fired uh, consecutively. <laughs> One of my American friends told me that last night, actually, at dinner. He told me, Guillaume, the huge difference between French people and American people, when you're seven years old, uh, you, at school, uh, when you do an essay, when you write an essay, mm -hmm. the question in France is like, what is your daddy or your mum is doing? Okay? The question in the US is like, why are you unique? Yeah. Yeah? So <laughs> from day one, um, they know how to sell. Mm -hmm. And our, our sales cycle takes like three to four months. So during two or three months, you're already blind. So you see your head of sales taking meetings and everything, <coughs> throwing money, you know, inviting clients, and you're like, cool. You know, stuff yeah, you like don't really pay attention. Yeah, and at some point you're like, but like is, is it normal that we're not making any money? <laughs> and um, so we got bullshit bullshitted a lot, and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and now it's finally, we mm -hmm. find the right person. You're getting there. And because eventually you fundraised with uh, American funds, with uh, one American fund. Um, so how, di how did you do it? How, how was the whole process like? Especially so we did two series. We did the, so we did the seed with uh, Xavier Niel, yeah. the seed in the car. Uh, <laughs> then we did the series A and series B, <coughs> which are very different. Series A, we, had, we never raised money because I don't consider the Xavier story like a fundraising. Because uh, if you think that it happens that way, it never happens that way. Um, so the Series A was very serious for us, and we had no idea th th which way to approach that. We have mm -hmm. absolutely no idea. So we we said we need to go to a uh, bank. Yeah. So you went to the bank. So I went to the banking world, to the private banking, saying we need to raise money. So plenty of banks are very happy with that. Um, and we got lucky because we find a, a bank, Lion Tree, um, run by Fatin late in, in France, uh, who loved Brut and she said, I'd be super happy to support. And we are like, cool, let's do it. So we built a deck. Uh, <laughs> it made me laugh so much because uh, for the second, for the Series B, we have the help of uh, like a fundraiser, like a professional fundraiser, Mark Wacknin, which was incredible. And he said, okay, can I see the deck of the Series A? And we, s we show him the deck, he was like, I, I swear, I, I, it, was, it, it went blank. He <laughs> was like, you raise money with that? I was like, yeah. The first time we pitched um, Jean uh, de la Roche Brochard at Kima, Xavier told us, go to Jean, we were lucky to have that insights. Go to Jean, Jean is seeing plenty of decks every day. It's going to be a huge help. So we have our deck, we go to see Jean, I start pitching. And I swear, I see him like sweating after one minute, like, you know, have weird body movement and everything. He was very uncomfortable with what I was pitching. And after one minute, he's like, stop. Do um, um, you know what? Give me 24 hours and uh, I come back to you. Uh, please leave. <laughs> <laughs> leave me alone. <laughs> so, so I was like, yeah, okay, sure. And he came back 24 hours saying, um, you know, and it, it, the funny thing is like he, he wrote a medium post the mm. day after that, saying, you know what, sometimes it's hard to express through a deck what a company is. Mm. So we were, that was our point. We, we had a very bad timing. We started to raise in the US mm -hmm. two days after Mark Zuckerberg announcement about the news feed change. I had yeah. 40 meetings in the US scheduled. 20 meetings were canceled that day. Straight away. And mm -hmm. I didn't even any, uh, they didn't even send me any email. I just had, you know, like the, the uh, notification, the notification like meeting canceled. <laughs> <laughs> so you're like, okay. So I was desperate. And I was in the US for two weeks with Lion Tree, with a lot of meetings. Uh, half of them were like down the drain. I knew that it was going to be tough. So I panicked, which is a very bad reflex. And I reached out to everybody I knew. But I say everybody is like everybody saying, I'm in deep shit. I need to raise money. We are, the runway is not incredible. 
um, help me. And actually it was good because people actually did help me, introduced me to a lot of people. And, and finally we, we made our Series B, our Series A, sorry. And you know, life is weird um, or funny. The, um, uh, so we saw a lot of American fans. We saw um, French one too. We were like too, uh, we were too big for French, too early for American, whatever. Um, and one guy was eating me on LinkedIn, a French guy uh, based in San Francisco, saying, "Oh, I love what you do at Brute. Um, I heard that you're raising money. Please contact me." And I was like, "I never raise money, so I was like, it cannot be serious. Uh, the guy is eating me on LinkedIn, not possible." One time, two times, three times. And that guy lead our series day. Okay? Wow. He's okay. our lead. He's incredible. Uh, he has a, a fund in San Francisco. He's a French guy. And at the very end of the series A, we had the choice between US fund and US fund made by French people. Mm -hmm. And we went for that part because we wanted the cultural proximity with the, mm -hmm. with the um, funds. Yeah, the fund. Mm -hmm. Series B much more complicated because Series B, people are awaiting you, they're expecting you to have results, to Intrigues. have strong business mm -hmm. case. Mm -hmm. um, and we were kind of there, but not totally. Um, so it, it took a while. We took a professional fundraiser, Mark, <laughs> which is very funny because uh, I was introducing, I was introduced to him by uh, Jean, actually, at Kima. And I went there very confident. I'm like, I'm going to give you a mandate to raise money for me. And I didn't understand that I was actually, I was going to be interviewed. It took me five meetings for Mark to say, yes, okay, I'm going to raise money for you. Because at the first meeting, he said, okay, I like you, but I don't understand your business. Okay? Second meeting was like, show me some KPIs. Like, I don't understand your KPIs, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end, he said yes, which was very reassuring for us to have him on board. And then we, uh, we had a process of, uh, it took me four months to do a deck. Uh, that's which, a lot. Yeah, it's <laughs> so long. Because like, you know, the good thing is like for the first time in my business, I really had to ask myself, what are we doing? Okay. Because yeah. I sure. never really asked myself that question. I was like, yeah, uh, yeah no, I'm producing content, but like, where do you want to be in five years? What is the vision? Yeah, what is the vision? Mm -hmm. So it was a good process. Mm -hmm. uh, it took us two months to raise and two weeks to close, which is, like a record breaking. Sure. Um, so the whole process was almost seven months. Yes, and okay. it's tough because thanks God I have strong partners because for seven months I was every day raising. Every yeah, day it's doing a full-time job. It's a full-time job. Full and you, you're all alone, you're scared, you see the runway coming. So <laughs> the, the first race we've done, the Series A, we closed, we closed the round 15 days after, um, I don't know the name in, in English, uh, after the cessation de paiement. Okay, I don't know how you say it in English. Like basically, we closed 20 days after having no money in the bank. Yeah. So, and we, we couldn't even pay the salary employees. of our employee. Um, so we closed 20 days after. So we were like, whew. the Series B, we closed the day of no money. So we get, actually we're getting better. So you're, you're good under pressure. Yeah, we we're getting better. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's so it's a scary process because even though you have term sheet, even though people are very committed, uh, you, I mean, as the day you have the money, you know, I always thought that raising money, the day you raised, the day it's closed, I always felt like you know what we're going to to do this like huge party. Mm. The truth is, you just relieved, mm. you really relieved, you tired. You go to sleep. <laughs> yeah, you go to sleep. And then you're like, uh, okay, so I raise money. I'm supposed to perform with that money. Uh, and it's, it's more stress. Um, yeah. So, you know, you learn to, to, to deal with that. And, f and uh, once again, I was lucky. I have partners, so you can speak to them. I'm yeah. very lucky to have people like Xavier around who can, you know, guide you through the, 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 the this journey. The yeah, but it's, it's tough. I had a... Uh, I had a, b a big meeting in New York two, two weeks ago uh, with eight founders of uh, one of my investors. Very successful company, Series A, Series B, some Series C. And we were all talking about that stage when you raise, where you, like, <laughs> you really feel like you're on your own. 
You know, and it's tough because you cannot communicate to your employee. You cannot say, you know what? That's so cool. In six weeks, we have, we have no more money. But don't worry, we have a term sheet. So you, it's, it's, um, it, you really need to go into a race um, thinking that it's going to be tough because it's going to be too. I mean, there's always counterexamples. Some people raise in two days. But when you do raise in two days, it means that you've been working on it for like eight months. Uh, we could have done that too. Mm -hmm. uh, we could have, say, when we're not raising, but sure. you know, having contacts and everything. So it's tough, but it's possible, obviously, and you get better at it. Yeah, the, yeah. the more you do it, you get better at it. And it can be long. Um, a lot of our founders, actually, they, they, they think that if the startup is good, if the metrics are good, um, that will be fairly easy to raise uh, funds within a few weeks. Um, yeah, almost for some of them, they think about raising within a few days, um, but the truth is that it takes a lot of time, yeah. even for very well-known uh, startups with very well-known brands and everything, so that's really good that yeah, and have It's this different. Mindset. Series A, basically, the VC world is going to look at you saying, okay, do I like the idea? Can they execute? Do I like the guy? Do I like the woman? Mm -hmm. uh, if I like the idea, if they have some traction, um, if I think they can execute, and you know, I can spend five years with that guy or with that woman, I go. That's the Series A. Uh, series B is like, okay, show me, show me results, okay? Uh, if I'm putting one box, what's the outcome? Uh, so it's, let's say, more professional. It's a whole other story. Mm. Um, I wanted to ask you about the, the brand thing because you're a media, but Brut is also a strong brand. And I'd like to have your perspective on, first of all, is that something that you worked on a lot or not? Is that something that, that you thought from the beginning and how much it helps you on a daily basis business-wise? Uh, yes, from day one, I'm obsessed by the brand. Um, and uh, actually my co-founder too. So we were obsessed by, um, we wanted something very brut, unfiltered. Yeah. You know, uh, raw. <coughs> so we were. <laughs> so we, we, when we started, we did the TV thing, which like you go to um, a design company and you're like, okay, it's, I have this brand. The mission of the brand is this. I want that and that and that. So they shoot a bunch of design and logos and everything, and we hated everything. First company, second company, third company, and every time you're paying. And at some point, we were like, okay, let's think. What uh, what is going to feel modern and what is going to be... So we had the example of Canal Plus. We worked a lot with Canal Plus. Canal Plus used the Helvetica mm -hmm. um, uh, typo. And for 20 years in France, Helvetica was cool and modern. You wanted to send the cool, like a do cool print stuff. You used Helvetica, thanks to Canal. So we were thinking this way. We were like, okay, what's... Um, something which is really used right now uh, by young people, which is going to define us as modern and cool. And we went to the Snapchat typo because we thought Snapchat is reaching a lot of young people. So they're going to get used to that typo and they're going to use it. And for them, it's going to be cool and modern all their life. So we should go there. So basically, when you look at Brut, the, it's the Snap typo, a little bit more bold. Uh, and it took us six months to, <laughs> to find it. Um, so actually, it's just a word. Then Brut, we're lucky. One of my producers came to me saying, Guillaume, you're always saying, I want Brut news. Like, je veux de l'information Brut. Uh, you don't want any mediation. Use Brut. So there's a famous, very famous deodorant in France named Brut by Fabergé. Mm. Uh, and we got, you were talking about luck, we got lucky. We look at the copyrights mm -hmm. and Brut, the deodorant has all the copyrights, but media. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's a mistake. I'm pretty sure the guy didn't eat the cross. So we, we, we look at it, we were like, what? <laughs> so we took it, we, uh, we protected it, so we have the copyright. And, we, and the good thing is Brut um, means the same thing in, the, in English. Yeah. Um, doesn't mean anything in Chinese. Um, but so we can use, and it's a short word, you know, this, this theory of short is, is mm -hmm. better too. Um, and the other thing is when you look at um, the way we do graphics and everything, it's, once again, it's made like a story. Mm -hmm. 
So that's why we have like round arrows because like it, it looks like we've drawn it yeah. uh, with our finger. Do you know the um, the, the parodies like in, uh, like boot? Yeah, that I love that it. That's really good, right? Yes, I love it. And I mean, it means so much in terms of the the strains of your brain, of the brain's brain. Yeah, we did a very funny. I mean, we did a super cool video this month with a, a guy who's a, a doorman, uh, who's a very famous uh, door guy for the nightclubs in Paris, and uh, the, yeah, and he was going advice on how to get in a club. Uh, we did million of views with that. And uh, French uh, a comedian Malik Bentala uh, did exactly the same thing. <laughs> it was so funny. It's a parody. So it's great. I mean, when you go into pop culture, exactly. that, that's that's the best. But to go back to the brand, um, that's why, except brute nature, that's why we didn't do. At the beginning, we tried brute sports. We tried brute pop. Uh, actually, that leads to brute nature. But outside of brute nature, because we thought that nature was so such a huge subject that we could do a full vertical. In terms of branding, I don't want to dilute my brand by doing, and I think, I actually, I think it makes no sense, by doing brute women, uh, brute minorities, like, it, it makes no sense. Why should we do brute women at a moment where we want to promote women? You know, it's, it makes no sense. Yep. And it dilutes the brand. Sure. All right, okay, um, thank you. You're welcome. That was, that was the first part of the conversation. Uh, and now it's your turn. So yeah, we'll, we'll take your question. Vlad is going to throw at you um, a box that is actually a mic, and you just have to, <laughs> talk, to the, talk to the box very closely. And then you can throw it at the people asking the next question. That's very fun, you'll see. Just That's be careful dangerous. with the with You're the, the first one? Yeah. OK, so you throw it to the next one then. And you speak here in the black thing, okay? Easy. You catch it? Ready? It's soft. Don't worry. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm I'm Guillaume. I'm working from uh, for Altis Media. I have uh, two questions in one uh, about the content you produce. How do you define the creative power of uh, brute, the creative style of brute to your clients? How do you define it? How is structure your uh, system of production of content in Brut? Do you have a, a cluster? Do you have a specific organization in countries or is it, uh, is it transverse or horizontal? And uh, you probably heard that Combini just launched uh, its creative uh, art shop, which is called uh, Kuhl. Uh, they launched it uh, 10 days ago, which will, be, uh, which will uh, serve all his clients in France and uh, in, the, in the Europe. What do you think about it? And uh, what is your ambition uh, according to it? Th there was like six questions, but that's fine. <laughs> <what? laughs> Thank you. Um, so the first thing is like I won't talk about Combini because by principle, I don't talk about other people. Uh, it's something I've done consistently. And I say to my team, it's like I have too much worth thinking of about you know, what I am doing that I, I don't have time to, to do that. And, to be very honest, I don't look at the competition. I don't, like, you know, they do great things. That's, that's great. So I won't be able to comment on, on, on them. Um, there's a huge difference. The only thing I can say, because it's relevant to the context of your question, is uh, the company was funded by uh, advertising people who were incredibly smart at the time to understand that in order to serve a campaign, they needed a media. So they created the media in order to run campaigns, which was an incredibly smart move, especially at the time. And they went onto that uh, cool entertainment, entertainment platform. Um, when it comes to brute and monetization and clients, um, we, the, the good thing is um, we never compromise on uh, substance um, editorially. So, when we launched Brute, we didn't even think about monetizing. There's one thing I know, and I think one thing I know about the generation who are following us, they love brands and they hate advertising. I'm going to do a very simple survey. Raise your hand if you like to see an advertising, like a pre-roll before a video anywhere. Or raise your hand if you like to see an ad break at the middle of the deal. Please go. Okay, so that's the state of advertising. Okay, nobody likes it. 
And especially, nobody likes the advertising to cut a program. Uh, but that's the schizophrenia of it. Um, they love brands. Okay. So we came up with a very simple idea, which was uh, let's tell brand stories, brute story with a brand. Let's endorse brands as long as we find it interesting and as long as it's aligned with our value. So we don't work with the oil company. We don't work with the big pharma. We don't work with anybody who try to greenwash themselves through us. Uh, we say no a lot. And believe me, when you have a young startup, and it comes back to the brand actually, but when you have a young startup and you say no to people who are coming to spend money, uh, that's tough. But it's the way you are defining brand integrity. And by the way, it's a great way to uh, have a better pricing power because you say no. And uh, once again, we had in mind Canal Plus. Uh, clients were coming to Canal Plus because they wanted to be associated to a cool brand and they were ready to pay a lot of money uh, to do that. So we, we had that in mind. One of our co-founder, Roger Cost, was the, the head of the sales force at Canal Plus for 15 years. And he was, from day one, when we went to monetization, he's like, we're going to be very high standard, very premium, very expensive to work with, because if you want to be associated with us, it's going to cost you a lot of money for a very simple reason. If I take Brut today in France, we have between seven and eight million daily active viewers. And we don't have an audience, we have a community of people, super engaged. We have the most engaged community in France, in India, in the US, in every territory we go. We know them, they are super aligned with who we are. So if you're a brand and you want to communicate on sustainability, for instance, um, uh, we are leading the social conversation in France about sustainability, actually about any kind of the part of the conversation on sustainability. So what we're telling our clients is very simple. Uh, you don't know how to address people under 35. They're super hard to reach. They're on social platform. They know more on TV. Um, if you want to reach them, you need to, uh, to spark a conversation. What type of conversation do you need to spark in order to go there? We know how to do that. And we will, and I mean, it's a strong commitment because we are not a media agency. Uh, if we say we do blue, if the clients say, oh, I want it pink, we say, no, we do blue. You know? And if they say, no, I want it pink, we say, okay, bye. And, and we, believe me, we lost quite a lot of clients at the beginning this way. But now we, we are working with almost everybody in a very good way. We have large campaign. We have a year long campaign now. We are already profitable in France thanks to advertising, and, and we do it this way. I'm always taking the same example. Um, the, the source of the um, video, of the news, it doesn't matter. It can be a brand, can be a press agency, can be something you've been reporting, as long as uh, the question is who's talking. Okay? In our case, Brut is talking, and Brut is trusted by our community on all those values. Uh, so our community knows that when we Speaking about women's rights, we are super engaged on those questions and there's no compromise. Um, so that's what we say to, to, our, to our clients. And I think it's a, it's, it's a long shot because uh, the media industry, the, the advertising industry is not um, wired that way. Uh, but I think it's the only, on, only way. Uh, a good example is, um, I don't know if you may remember a Pepsi ad with uh, Kendall Jenner was for you know, yeah, like the march, of, uh, the march of minorities, okay? So you had people in the street in the US and you know, they're going to solve the solution with a Pepsi can. Huge backlash, apologize, and you know, like they retired, they, they took the campaign off and everything, Kendall Jenner had to apologize. Three weeks after Coca-Cola did a uh, ad, uh, ad in um, Saudi Arabia, with a young Saudi woman driving a car, because finally the Saudis said women are allowed to drive. And everybody on the planet said it's an incredible ad, you know, because it was aligned in terms of value. If you look at Nike, Nike took uh, Colin Kopernik in the US. Colin Kopernik is very well known to protest uh, Trump and the flag, you know, he was kneeling uh, every time the national anthem was played. It's incredibly bold to do that from Nike, but they acquire the old generation totally online on that on, on value. So we're big on value, we don't compromise, 
and if they want to work with us, we think it's the way we have in impact with our clients because if they want to work with us, they need to, com to comply in a way. So okay. sorry, I, I don't know if I answer your question, but... No, okay. good answer, thanks. Your sixth question? Mm -hmm. And not six reports. Okay, cool. Thanks. You're welcome. Someone speaking? It looks very dangerous. Um, hello, my name is Tatiana. Um, do you probably know that a lot of the young people have own social media as their only source of news? What do you think of people taking Brut as their only or your competitors? Do you think we can trust you as our only source, or should we? It's a, it's a, ter <laughs> it's a terrifying question. Yeah. Um, uh, but it's a very good point. The, um, yes, we are very well aware that for a lot of people we are reaching, we are the only source of news. Uh, the, the Reuters Institute is, um, is doing a, a survey every year um, in uh, trust in journalism. We became in 18 months in France the third most trust, trusted source of news behind Le Monde, Mediapart. Um, for, for the people who are actually watching Brut. Obviously, if you don't know Brut and if you don't watch us, it's hard to be a trusted uh, news source. Uh, but for the people who are um, actually engaging with our content, we are the third most trusted source of news, very close from Le Monde and Mediapart. Mediapart is an inv investigation platform, so I think you absolutely do trust investigation normal and Le Monde has investigation in many other things it's a very uh, well-known legacy brand um, we have a huge responsibility so for instance when I met investor they were always saying go to membership do a subscription model you know you have you have, you have free media ad base we don't like advertising you know it's too complicated do membership no I won't do membership for exactly that reason. It's a it's, um, civic point of view, but uh, um, with everything that's happening, with young people consuming news on social platform, there's no way, I was going to say no fucking way, that I'm going to put brute behind a paywall. Uh, you know, we have this, res this responsibility. The other thing is, uh, I think the best way to fight fake news is to educate. Fact checking is great. We need to do fact check, and especially when the when it helps the platform to uh, remove the fake news. But more than fact checking, um, we need to yeah educate. So it's what we we're trying to do with Brute. We're trying to educate um, uh, people on on topics in order for them to go into more educated conversation and to make their own their own mind. The other thing is we live in a very polarized world especially like uh, pretty much everywhere actually. So we are a big believer in uh, the power of conversation. The best way to uh, make sure people can uh, you know, get closer is through conversation. So yes, we are very well aware of our responsibility. We take it very seriously. Every single uh, journalist at Brut has a carte de presse. Uh, and it's uh, actually, I was very happy when we launched Brut that the carte de presse uh, committee was very like cool with us saying yeah of course you're a journalist and it's something I hate I mean we are always uh, there's like brood the new media the legacy media and I think that at, at some point there's journalists we're doing our job on different format different platform uh, we do it maybe in a more authentic or natural way for younger people and generation we are aligned with what really do matters to them we just did a huge survey on our community the two things that they are saying are the following. First, uh, we feel like the topic that really do matters to us, we don't see it in the public space. We don't see it in the media space. Second one, we want to act, we want to have impact, but we have no idea how to do it. And uh, for me, that's really the future of Brut. Yes, we do have a responsibility to inform, but we do have a responsibility to give the tools to have impact. So it's going to be our next chapter. 
Thank you. Uh, hello, Guillaume. Hello. Thank you for your speech. It was very interesting. I have uh, two questions. Very simple. The first one is, how do you see the future of the media? The second one is, what is the biggest threat to Brut? Uh, future of media, we can spend two more hours if you want. Um, it, like, once again, for me, there's no, there's not a crisis of media, there's not a crisis of attention, there's not a crisis of information, there's a crisis of the industry, maybe, but um, people need media, they need to relate to the, to the world, and you know what? People are incredi incredibly smart and informed, so um, if you're able to add value to your, to topics that matters to them, they, 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 there's always going to be media. You need media to relate to the world. So th the only future that I can see is bright. Okay, and we'll came, you know, new new business models are going to come up. There's plenty of things work which are going to come with uh, with the uh, augmented reality before even VR and everything. So this is a huge field. So for me, the future of media is bright. It doesn't mean that the industry is not going to underway a lot of uh, transformation, but the future of media is bright. And for your second question, which is what's the biggest threat? Um, I don't know, I guess uh, us at Brut. Um, <laughs> you know, I just, I just found out that the word blasé is the same in English. So it means it comes from France. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's kind of scary. Um, so, um, you know, it, it's what we're telling, uh, and, and the team is very uh, well aware of that. We're doing 1.5 billion views a month. We are engaging 300 million people a month, 30 million people a day. That's insane, you know, and it's only the beginning. We have, in India, we have 90% of the share of voice on news on social platform, 90%. So, um, I think the, the biggest threat for us is absolutely not algorithm change and all this stuff. We survived three or four algorithm change, and you know what? Algorithm, especially like on all social, they change every day. Uh, so the question is like, what type of relationship do you have with your audience and community? Um, and it to, in order to build a brand, what we want is like we want to make sure that every time you are engaging with a brood content, every time you see our logo, you're going to say, cool, I've learned something, I didn't think about it, about it this way, I didn't know about it, it's interesting. And the other thing which is linked to being data-driven, the uh, biggest threat would be being data-driven. If you're a media, if, I don't understand being a media being data-driven. If you're data-driven, you're going to serve to, to people things they already know they like. You like dog, I'm pushing you, you know, dog, dog content or cat. Um, a media has to serve things people have no idea they like, but because they trust you, they're going to engage with the content. So I think the biggest threat is it's pretty much us. It's just to make sure we maintain that level of, uh, uh, you know, uh, exigence. Uh, I don't know the name in English, actually. Uh, what? Demand. Um, and that we, you know, we don't get used or, and, and we have a, so I'm going to answer to one of the six questions over there, uh, you're welcome. We, we have a very horizontal um, way to produce. We try to have very little level of hierarchy in Brut um, and it's the same everywhere. We don't open offices everywhere. We bring people to our offices, so our Indian team we found an incredible Indian team, we flew them back to Paris and now they're living in Paris. The same for Chinese, Japanese, whatever. Um, and as long as we um, don't get lost in, you know, you have rich, rich people problem when you grow. I never thought that raising $40 million would be a problem. Not, I mean, of course it's, it's tough to raise it, but as soon as you get the money in the bank account, it's, it's scary, you know, because you need to process, you, you grow, you're growing really fast. So maybe the biggest threat is the growth, you know, which can feel counterintuitive, because at the beginning you're like, wow, if I have growth, that's cool. But if you have growth, 
you do everything at the same time, everything goes very quickly, you don't have the time to think. So actually, we, the, the Series B for us, it's really a time to think. Like, let's clean our room, let's process the company, let's focus on, on country that we already have. You know what, we already have like 10 active market, we can open 20 more in two years, we can wait. Uh, so yeah, probably us and the growth, how do we handle that? And you need, and by the way, just a very simple advice, in order to grow, you need to find people, I mean, as you scale, you need to find people who have done it at least one time, because I have no idea. Okay, so you, you really do need to have people around you who, who know what they're doing. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hi, uh, thank you for your speech. Uh, quite inspiring. Um, you said interesting about your values, about how, it, how important it is to educate your audience, to give raw, genuine content. And I, would, I wonder what kind of things you forbid yourself in terms of uh, content production. Uh, you don't want to look like the legacy media, but I'm curious about maybe some temptation you had and things you like, no, we shall not cross that line. And, um, and yeah. one last, another question, sorry, is that you said there's no uh, attention crisis. Um, I'm currently doing a mission, consultancy mission for a big company about attention. Some people talk about the ecology of intention and not more the economy of it. Could you tell me why you think you, you, you're not challenged or you're not facing that, uh, that, that problem, that issue of attention? Okay. So I really forget the first question. Uh, uh, what do you forbid yourself? Okay. Um, we, so one thing we absolutely do forbid ourselves, clickbait. Sensational, sensationalism. Like, you know what? If I want to thrive in the US, every day I do a Trump story. Uh, and I say, and I go, and I, and I put a call to action, and I point finger, and I like, and, antag and antagonize, and you know. Um, I think it's bad, you know, so no, no clickbait, we try to to stay the more, um, yeah, non clickbait for sure, and not sensationalism, so we forbid that kind of stuff. After, we don't really forbid anything, as long as it's aligning with our values. Um, we just done a video on the clitori, clitoris, we did 13 million views, based on a very simple conversation we had one morning in the newsroom, one of our uh, women journalists who's, uh, we have like 50, 15 brute, 50% 50 men, 50% women. And um, one of our women journalists say, does um, anyone have the idea, like know how to draw a clitoris? Take a piece of paper, do it. I swear it was like funny as hell. Because like, no, like nobody, like women obviously much more than men, uh, but still, so we said, you know, it's a good, it's, it's a good way to do it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, d we are really, except ex clickbait, except antagonizing, um, we don't do it. And regarding legacy media, what we try to do is like, we try to forbid ourselves to follow the new cycle if we don't add value to it and if we feel like it's not really a, a matter for the generation who are following us. You know what? If I take the impeachment in the US, it's a kind of a bold statement, but people under 35, or like at least people under 25, they don't care. You know, so why should they watch 24 seven content on impeachment? You know, there's, believe me, there's other issue in the US, there's college debt, there's anxiety through climate, there's anxiety through guns, there's like plenty of things you can explore. That's what we're doing. Um, so yeah, we, we forbid ourselves to do that. And did I answer the second question? There was something about attention crisis. Yeah, attention crisis. Uh, as w once again, um, I don't understand the attention crisis. There's there's an issue with the the inf the infinity of choice. So it's tough to choose, and it's it's tough to engage. But if you put your attention somewhere. And if you're not disappointed, you're going to watch as long as it, once again, we binge, we, we, we binge watching Netflix. So if there's a crisis of attention, why? I don't agree with that. No, I don't, I don't, actually, you don't do everything at the same time. You do one thing at a time. Like, it's not true. You not, like when you do, when you watch a Netflix show, for instance, or Amazon show, whatever the show is, and you're texting, when you're texting, you're texting, okay? 
And yes, you have the background and you know the context because you're only missing 20 seconds of what's happening, but actually you're not doing two things at the same time. You're doing one thing after another. Uh, so I don't know, no, I, I, I absolutely, yes, there's, a, there's an issue of distraction, okay, for sure, because there's so many choice. Um, and it goes to plenty of other questions like, you know, what is uh, uh, likes, you know, what likes are doing to you in terms of attention and everything. That's another uh, issue. So no, I really don't think there's a crisis of attention. Hi. You spoke about augmented reality before yes. as something innovative. Can you elaborate on why that resonates with you? Um, <laughs> it's a tough question. Um, so first thing is I have no idea. I have no idea. But the only thing I know is we're going to get there. That's for sure. When you look at every research studies and everything, it's, it's unbelievable what it's going to unlock. Um, and like everything, I think it's going to go through people who are just experiencing with it. And at some point, some stuff are going to happen when it's going to be crossover between, uh, I don't know, a young tech guy and a journalist or someone who's fascinated by creating stories. Like, uh, I, I don't know if you heard of an um, Instagram account named Lil Mikela. Uh, so Lil Mikela is a young influencer uh, in uh, LA, I think. Uh, she has 1.5, 1.6 million followers. She doesn't exist. It's pure CGI. It's fascinating. For me, for instance, I would love to be able to create that in order to send CGI influencer in part of the world who are tough to reach. Because it would be great to, uh, you know, establish that connection and being able to, to. Uh, you know, like establish that bond between the community and someone, even 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 if someone doesn't exist, it is fascinating. And for us, as we grow old, we see everything with our uh, filter from 20 years ago, because basically you form your intellect when you're a student, when you go to uh, when you go to your first job and everything. And then the more you grow old, you're like, oh no, we never work anything. I, I mean, I remember perfectly the first day I've seen YouTube. I was a young journalist, I've seen YouTube, and I remember exactly what I said to myself. I'm like, that's a bunch of crap. I don't understand why people are going to go there. It will never work. That was my take on YouTube, okay? Um, so AR is going to be fascinating, and I think AR is going to come first because AR is going to be enabled by uh, glasses, and it will happen at some point. Whereas VR, you emerge in a world where you don't connect. Um, so the first step is going to be AR, and it's going to be fascinating. Hi, Guillaume. Um, thank you for sharing a brute story. You're welcome. Um, I have a question for you about uh, attention, because uh, I agree with you that there's no attention crisis at the moment, but still, I think there's been a shift uh, in the way we consume uh, content. And by that, I mean uh, there's a shift in attention span. So we are more and more informed, but we have less and less time for every media and every source of news that we, we check. And so I think it's kind of the iTunes effect. You know, before iTunes, we used to buy uh, albums, entire uh, music albums, and uh, listen to it. And then arrived iTunes, and then we, we, we started to buy songs and listening to just one or two songs from one artist, and then to, to shift to another artist. And I think uh, it's also the way social networks uh, function, you know, like there's one post and then another one and another one. So our attention ban span has uh, shrinked a lot, I think. And one way to address that is to produce also snackable content. So content that you can consume immediately and then switch to another one. And I wonder, I wonder what's your take uh, on, on this, on the attention span and snackable content? How do you work with that uh, at, uh, at Brute? So, um... The first thing is, I disagree um, with what you said. Um, and what you've been describing to me is not an issue of attention. It's not because you're going to watch multiple things, uh, multiple things, as long as you have, you know, you can decide if it's one minute, if it's five minutes, if it's whatever. Um, as long as you keep your attention on something, 
that's that's fine to me. Um, you have two world. You have social network world and you have OTT world, like Netflix, Amazon, and everything. YouTube maybe could be in the middle. Um, social network, it's a place of small content, like short content. OTT is a place of long content. Um, actually, we're seeing, like at Brut, we are producing more and more many documentaries, 12 minutes, 20 minutes, 26 minutes long. We distribute them on Facebook, on YouTube, and everything, and it works. We have incredible retention rate. One of our journalists just came back to Syria when he was able to go into the jail of Syria. Uh, we did, um, I think, 16, 17 minutes long documentary. We have 95% retention. So, uh, we are not producing short content because we think we are feeding the attention war. Uh, we are producing short content because it's uh, the time we need. We need three to four minutes to develop one idea and to have a high intensity of information on this particular idea. Um, the, the, for me, once again, it's not a question of attention, it's a question of choice. There's too many choice, and the biggest issue, because it's so new, is like we are not educated at choosing. You know, that's the biggest issue for us. Once again, I'm 45, I'm born and raised in a world where my choice were very simple. Five network, free newspaper, like, you know, a little bit more obviously, uh, free five radio, so my choice was easy. So at some point, if I didn't find what I wanted, I could do something else. I could go, I don't know, do, to the gym, <laughs> I could do you know, whatever you want, read or whatever. The issue right now is like, you can have access to content indefinitely, um, but you are not educated to that. Um, you're not educated to what's the hierarchy of news. You're not educated to plenty of, of, uh, of subjects. So I think the, the everyone, us, the audience, uh, the social platform, at some point, and probably the government and the schools, at some point, we need to address that. The issue is, it's, it's too young. There's almost no studies yet. The type of studies we're seeing in uh, North America are frightening. Uh, so, I, you know, I think that the, the 10 years to come, we're going to address those issues. But for me, once again, it goes through education. The, I'm a big believer in tech. Uh, I don't think a, a social platform is bad or good. I think it depends on you know, the use you, you, you have a bit. Um, so, um, but once again, it's, from, to me, it's going to be a question of education. Let's take maybe a couple of other questions. Thank you, Guillaume. Uh, yes, you told uh, before that uh, the fact of being brute what, uh, was uh, at the core of uh, your brand's uh, identity. Then you told us that uh, you wanted to take advantage of the Series B to build uh, processes to clean the house. So how will you ensure that uh, those processes will not alter your uh, identity and then uh, by, al by uh, killing like your authenticity? Uh, for a very simple reason, it's like what we need to process has nothing to do with uh, content production. So the way we produce content, the way we decide to produce content, the way it's handled, the way it's streamlined, the way it's distributed, that's it. We're done, that's absolutely processed and everything. We need to process everything else. Uh, we need to process HR. We need to process sales. We need to process the, uh, not data because we don't have first party data, but uh, a, a better an understanding of the behavior of our uh, community and everything. That's everything that we need to process. We're going to launch, we're going to test before launching. Uh, uh, impact platform uh, that we are calling Brute Action um, in order to give tools to the people to uh, have a better saying in the way we are doing our content, uh, in order to give, provide them with tools to have more impact, because um, I think it's, it's, it's the big issue. So we d I'm, not afraid of, um, um, I'm not afraid of the process taking down our integrity. The only thing I'm afraid of is the bandwidth. And one of the mistakes we've done, so now, it's the, now we know, one of the mistakes we've done is like when you are a, a new startup, you don't want to spend too much. So you hold back on recruiting people. 
but in our case, with our hyper growth, uh, it, it was a mistake for the first year. And then at some point, we understood that we absolutely needed to recruit people and to anticipate. Um, so that's why we raise money, and we raise money like every year, 18 months, and we're going to raise again in uh, a year, maybe 18 months, I don't know. Um, but a big raise, could we be ready to process? We will have strong business case in France, in India, in the US, and everything. Um, but yeah, and, and I'm, I'm so, I feel so blessed and lucky to have the kind of uh, partners and the kind of team we have. The um, brute nature is an incredible success across the globe. It's run, it's, it's run by uh, uh, Clément, who is uh, not even 25. Uh, he came as an intern, uh, actually he came as an intern because he did uh, uh, movie making studies. And we wanted to do brute pop, like pop culture. And um, so we thought it was a good idea. Um, we didn't really like what we were doing. So any, he, he had like one month left. So we said, what do you want to do? You know, it's like, oh, I love, you know, the environment, nature, maybe we should try. We were already doing stuff, you know, obviously on the everyday. So we said, okay, I'll focus on that. Fast forward, brute nature is the biggest nature um, vertical in the world, uh, socially. And it's not even 25. And actually the good thing is, I think Brut needs to, I mean Brut as a company, we need to absolutely align on, on our value. So we say, you know what, in 2020 we want to be carbon neutral as a company. So we've been calculating our carbon footprint through everything. And we try to modelize the type of energy that uh, the social platform are using to provide our uh, videos. S and we did something because we don't want to do it top down. We went to the Brute Nature team uh, and we told them, look, we want to be carbon neutral. Are you interested in handling that transition for us? They say yes. So now they, they, we are fully engaged in that transition. So for instance, they're saying to us, no more, no more um, plastic or paper glass. So everybody has a gourd. Yeah? And so there's no more glass at Brute. Uh, then they say, you know what, we don't, need to we don't need really to recycle, we need to reduce. So no more Deliveroo, because there's plastic everywhere. You know? So now people are starting to come with uh, their own food. Are we finding ways? But, um, uh, and the, the, the stuff we cannot reduce, we're going to offset anyway. But it's very interesting to see, uh, as long as you trust the people in your organization and you make them grow, you're going to keep your integrity. It's the day you think that you can decide everything by your own that you're going to lose everything. But we try to uh, empower, to empower the, the, our team and we, have, we are so lucky. So I was talking with Shruti, the Indian uh, woman who's our senior editor, like the, the producer now. She's been incredible. Uh, setting up a whole organization in India, thriving and everything. We have so many um, young and interesting people. Uh, we need to, to trust them. I mean, I'm obviously, I'm not going to be the one doing that. I had the idea. I had a very clear vision of what I wanted. I was lucky enough to be in a professional environment of people where I could do that. And Renaud, my partner, made it possible. I sent him a text when we launched, when, when I had the idea. I sent him a very long text, which, which was a very angry text. But everything about Brute was in it. And he just answered, oh, it's cool, let's go. Yeah. So I'm very lucky to have those people around I'm, and, and you absolutely need to make sure you surrender yourself with people who are like much more intelligent than you are uh, and especially in, in, in stuff that you don't know and people with experience. I think one of the reasons why Brut has been successful is because some of our partners are more, have more than 60s. Laurent, the editorial director and myself, we are over 40. Uh, Rémi Buizin, uh, who went from so Remy is, our journal, is the journalist who is doing all the live, the Facebook live for Brut. The first Facebook live, we did 12 views. 12. It was Macron announcing his campaign. 12 views. It probably was us and I guess Remy Mum. Um, two years and a half after the third weekend of the Yellow Jacket, Les Gilets Jaunes, on Les Champs Elysees, we did the 12 hours Facebook live. Uh, who, which gather 22 million French people. 22 million French people watch that Facebook Live. And you know why? Th thanks to Remy. 
because Remy is an, is an incredible way to talk to people, to be immersed. That day, he was hit twice by the water cannon, once by a grenade, the desencerclement. Um, and he was like, oh, that's tough. I just, <laughs> I just got hit by a grenade. And he's like, oh, I'm all wet. He was like, oh, be careful. He was like, this guy is incredible. So, you know, building a team from the bottom up, empowering your employee, that's great. And make sure you have people that, you know, have done things. When you need to grow, people have done it before. So go to that people. Okay, one, one last question. <laughs> Uh, hi, uh, my name is Miguel. I'm from Mexico. So cool. You are really famous in Mexico also. Thank you. So it's it's for my hear. first time here and here in the family and so on. So my question is about culturally, we are really different. French and Mexicans, we are really different. You drink wine, we, we drink tequila, you are more... <laughs> we do the, the drink yeah. tequila too, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you are more worried about retirement or strikes, we are more worry about party and the wall between the United States yeah. and us. So how you adapt your content about different countries? So what we do is very simple. Uh, if I take a Facebook example, we know that we, when we're going into a country, we need to do around five to six videos a day. It's a good number of videos. Uh, so when we, I'm going to take the example of Mexico. We launched six months ago in Mexico. Uh, the first thing we've done is like we went into our own insights. We took our best performing global videos. We translated them to Spanish, uh, or we would say to Mexican even, and uh, we tested the market this way. We saw an incredible engagement. Then when we were confident enough, we started to do local content. So when we decide to open a country, we do exactly the same thing. We recruit. Uh, a senior, very, very experienced senior producer from the field. So we had a, a woman named Bibi uh, who was with us uh, from Mexico. And uh, we start to do domestic content. So in Mexico, for instance, we've done like three global video, three domestic. In France, we do three glo like four global, four domestic. In India, we do mm, like three domestic, three global and everything. That's the way we do it. because. I agree, uh, obviously there's differences, but there are a lot of similarities to on value. We pretty much uh, align on the same value everywhere. Um, and uh, you know, maybe we should do more stories about tequila, uh, but uh, you know, my team will end a lot, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Well, okay. <laughs> okay, the last, <laughs> yeah, last yeah, question. Hello, um, so I'm a, I'm a deaf person and I'm gonna express myself in sign language and I'm, uh, be, I'm gonna be translated by the interpreter. Uh, I wanted to share my experience because uh, I created uh, my company about uh, media as well and to give information to uh, the deaf and hard of hearing because they really have a, a hard time to access to news because they have sometimes subtitles, but then 70% 70 70 of deaf people uh, suffer from illiteracy. So they can't really access the news. And uh, I created um, a new agency for communication to create accessibility. And what I was uh, offering to you would be to translate maybe uh, the video uh, so you can have uh, sign language uh, in your in your media, because brut is like this really rich experience, uh, and you know you you miss like three hundred thousand uh, deaf um, audience. So you need to adapt your videos uh, as you already did with the captions, and how you said you can do it for the Mexican uh, people. So maybe you can do it for the deaf people too. Cool. Thank you. Um, uh, inclusion is a huge issue for us um, and we need to, so it, it, it's getting back to bandwidth. Um, uh, we absolutely want to find a way to address that issue. Um, actually we are working, like in the US we work a lot with um, people who are doing what we call inclusive design um, and we're going to address those issues. So, the problem for us is the 
the following. Um, we need to do it at scale. Uh, and so far, we haven't figured out how to do it at scale. Then there's another issue, which is um, the size on um, the, like most of our content is watched on mobile phone. So if we do what TV has done, which is actually just a small um, uh, inbox picture, it's, it's very small. So what we're thinking right now with the impact platform we want to launch is like how do we embrace inclusion and how do we make sure that we can build a destination where uh, we are answering that question. But I think in order to do it at scale, we need to, to build a destination to it. I don't see, I mean, the subtitle were a, a first part of the answer, but, and, and to your point, I totally agree. Um, we need to, we need, once again, we need, we need to do it at scale. In order to, to do it at scale, I think we need to build a platform. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, if, you, if you look at the numbers in the US, 20% of the workforce is um, disabled in some ways. Um, so if I do the math, we should do 20% of our content um, on, on this matter. But like, you cannot think in terms of st statistic, obviously. Um, we do a lot of inclusion on, on inclusion, and we're going to even push uh, better. We met an incredible woman in, uh, in the US named Christina Malone. Uh, her story is very uh, uh, appealing. She lost the use of her hands and arms um, in the uh, eight, time, eight years period of time. And basically, she's challenging, and she has a huge job in advertising, she's close to the CEO of Microsoft, she's close from, uh, to Jeff Bezos at Amazon, and she are, she's challenging them, saying, you know what, um, there's uh, actually the touch screen, the autonomous drive, um, all vo even Alexa and the uh, voice assistants, all those technological breakthrough were made thanks to inclusive design. It was, you know, it, first, of, first of all, it was people f trying to find ways to solve that issue. So how do you give back? Um, and to elaborate even more, in order to build that platform and to be that destination, I need the help of the private sector or even to the, to the big private foundation. So right now in the US, we are talking to... Um, uh, uh, good amount of uh, private foundation in order to say you're very being in inclusion, help us, because you know what, uh, it's, I'm going to say a very sad thing, and I think actually it's moving, and I know that our board is supporting me, my board is supporting me on that, but if I go to the VC world saying I need to raise money to address uh, inclusion, most of them are going to say, mm, no, I pass, um, which is horrible, but that's true. So we need to figure a way to, uh, to go there, because Christina Malone told me that uh, story that I think is incredible. Uh, Microsoft um, did a huge job in order to integrate even better um, disabled people in its, in its uh, workforce. So they came up with software, with solution to uh, you know, have those people on board much better. It turned out to be a 1.6 trillion dollars business because they did it before everybody and everybody came to them saying, oh, you have an incredible culture, you have a lot of disabled people, you have inclusive tools, um, can we just buy them or can we rent them? And it was a 1.6 trillion uh, dollar business. So not only I think it's uh, uh, in terms of value, we need to address that issue and we are going, I mean, we are doing it as we speak. Um, and, but even if I'm being very pragmatic, uh, it's a very good business. Once again, 20% of the workforce is uh, disabled. We need to address them. Um, advertiser needs to address them. The um, disabled community has an incredible spending power. Um, so, you know, it, we have all the reason to do it. So, sorry, it's a long answer, um, but we are doing it as we speak. We need to do it at scale. we not that far from doing it. And, you know, I, I, was, I was saying we want to be carbon neutral. 
uh, we want to make sure that the inclusion is a big thing for us too. Thank you. You're Thanks a lot, guys. Uh, Thank it was you. great to see you. Good luck on the lead.